Kenny Wilson, your friendly neighborhood public information officer. It is the first Tuesday of the month and that must mean it is City Council Day. We just finished a City Council meeting uh, a while ago. It's a pretty thin agenda, but there was one thing I think on there that is of real impact and interest and importance to our community and that is definitely the proposal today to add eight new firefighters. So here to join us talking about that is our fire chief Brian Dunn. Chief, thank you for being with us. Well, thank you for having me. So there was a lot of discussion today about a SAFER grant, which is a federal grant. Explain what the SAFER grant is and, and what it does. The SAFER grant is a staffing grant for emergency responders to help put in place uh, extra staffing or staffing that meets national standard for certain apparatus. So what we applied for was getting a fourth person on our aerial vehicle and a battalion chief aide. And when you talk about an aerial vehicle, you're talking about Ladder 1, the big ladder truck that people may see uh, around town. I am talking about Ladder 1, the 100-foot aerial that's down at Central Fire Station. It's a very complex technical piece of equipment, and when we do aerial operations, it takes multiple people to uh, run that thing properly. So talk, talk about that, I mean, because what we're really dealing with is a safety issue for the firefighters who are uh, operating that apparatus, and that created a need for more personnel. Talk about the safety aspect that's gonna be met through this grant. So what we have, we generally staff that. We have a minimum right now of three-man staffing on this truck. Once those personnel are hired and trained, we will go to four-person minimum on this truck. And the reason for that is in this truck that if we're running water or pumping operations, there's one of the driver will be at the pump panel. There also needs to be one person at the, at the um, platform panel to control the ladder and the platform up there. And then there's a minimum of two guys in the uh, platform while they're operating it. So it takes a minimum of four people to do that safely and do it properly. Before, we've, we've managed, we've done this before in the past, but the problem is that if you don't have those people, you have to start killing other fire engines to bring enough people in to do some of this. So we're taking fire protection away from other areas when we were doing this in the past. And when you talk about that, taking fire protection away from other areas, so firefighters may be called from other stations that leave them maybe slightly depleted? Well, we would call, take, bring that engine. If we got a big fire or something going, we're calling an extra engine down here to use the manpower from that to help us do these operations. I see. And so talk a little bit about how this SAFER grant works from a financial standpoint, because what it does, it helps uh, pay for the salaries and benefits of these additional personnel, but only for a limited amount of time. That's right. The SAFER grant uh, helps pay for these personnel during the first three years. So for the first year, the city has to pay for 25% of the benefits. In the second year, the city has to pay for the salary and 25 or 25% of the salary and benefits. And in the third year, the city uh, pays for 65%, I believe, of the salary right. and benefits. And then after that, the city assumes all all the salary and benefits, uh, they're paying for all of that. So the fourth year cost then will be $600,000 and that will continue right. on ad infinitum. As long as those people are there. Yeah, and so of course that, I mean, that represents a very big financial commitment, but it seemed like the city council was fully supportive of, uh, of what you're trying to do with this grant. It does. Um, Chief Samford and some of the guys, they, they set the truck up and they showed them what we were dealing with in these situations. And I think that made an impact on them understanding what we have to do on these emergency scenes to not only keep us safe, but keep the citizens safe. And you had as big of a crowd of firefighters as I can recall seeing at a city council meeting, regardless of the issue that's being talked about, whether it's salaries or anything else. Why do you think there were so many firefighters who felt the need to be there today? Well, these two positions, uh, we've been talking about this for a year and working on this for, for about a year. Um, this affects their safety and their well-being, and this was one of their priorities during this last year. You also talked about providing some personnel that would be assistance to the battalion chief uh, who is in charge of each shift. We have three different shifts, 24-hour shifts. The battalion chief's in charge of those shifts. So talk about how this person's gonna be able to, to help the battalion chief. So what this person would do, we used to actually, we, used to, we actually had this position back in 1999 and when we put that fourth ambulance in place that the they were hiring for one year and for the next well they ran into financial difficulties so they pulled those four people that we had doing that at the time and make, and put them doing the ambulance duty so basically we lost those four back about 20 years ago so we've been trying to get those four back in place to where they were 
So what this person will be doing for the as a battalion chief, they will uh, be driving him on all emergency runs. So if we have a fire going on, you have five or six emergency vehicles responding to this fire other than the battalion chief. So he is constantly talking to them on the radio and laying out a strategy. They're telling him what they see and what they have and he's giving them orders on how to set things up to, to deal with this fire. So you can imagine trying to navigate traffic and do that and think and talk while he's doing moving towards that uh, emergency scene. That's one thing. These guys uh, also, when they show up on the scene, they are also, we kill gas and electricity so it reduces uh, the, you know, makes the scene more safe for us so we're not dealing with those two utilities. Uh, this aid will also monitor our, our telemetry system. And in our air packs that we got last year or the year before, there's, um, equipment in those air packs that will tell you who this person is in this, so say we're in a big building, it tells you where they're at, how much air they got, we're monitoring them and we're monitoring the conditions in there. So this individual will be doing, helping do that uh, while the bat chief's commanding the scene. So in other words, if you have a firefighter involved in, in a scene and perhaps he's in a burning building and he's running low on air, this person can say, done. Get out of the building, you're yes. almost out of air. And talk to them, tell them, hey, you, you and your partner need to come out, you're running low. Because a lot of times, even though we have alarm stuff on this equipment, it's very difficult to hear in those uh, inside a building that's on fire because it's extremely loud in there. Very good. And so when might you anticipate that these eight additional firefighters will actually be available to you on the floor of fire station? On the floor, we will hire these individuals in December in two months and it our training takes 18 months. So they will not be available to us until about the end of May of 2020. Because it takes about a year and a half to become it, It's eight uh, hours a, a day training for firefighter paramedic for us. So 18 months of eight hour a day training. So, so you're really not hiring firefighters, you're hiring cadets who at some point will then become firefighters, knock on wood. Yes. Very good. So while we have you here, Chief Dunn, I wanted you to provide our viewers just an <coughs> update on the move to Nexel Alerts, which uh, you know we've done some public information in the past, just letting people know that we're going to be phasing out warning sirens in favor of Nexel Alerts. Where does that process stand right now? Right now, we're we're pretty sure we're up and going. We've been testing it, uh, used it a couple times. Um, so the iPaws or Integrated Public uh, Alert System System Integrated Public Warning System Warning System uh, is up. And what this system does, we're going to use this instead of the sirens going forward in the future. This system will, it's not a sign up system like PD for Nixle if you want to know about Rex. This is used strictly for emergency situations um, and it goes to all cell phones like an Amber Alert does. It will go through to home phones. You can pick it up on Twitter, email, all these different uh, medium, media mediums. Um, one of the biggest benefits for it is though that most of the sirens that we have and the ones that we can't test them anymore because we updated our CAD system and they don't, they do not uh, talk to each other. So we're not exactly sure how many of the actual sirens still function because most of them were bought in the 50s, 60s and 70s. So most of them are 40, 50, 60 years old. Um, the biggest benefit though is that there, most of the sirens are inside the city of San Angelo. There was two in Great Creek, one in Highland Range, I believe, and one in Cristobal. So you have population pockets throughout Tom Green County, and this system we're doing goes anywhere in Tom Green County. Or we can cut it off, say the northern half of Tom Green County might have a, tor to a tornado warning. We can limit it to that instead of everything. But like Water Valley and Wall and some of these other population pockets had no warning system in the past. Now all these places and everybody will get a warning. And of course, one of the big benefits is you'll get specific information about a specific threat as opposed to a warning siren that really doesn't tell you what's happening or what you should do. Yeah, that was an issue before. So when the warning sirens went off for, say, a tornado, you didn't know if they went off for hail, high wind, a tornado. So what happened was you had large numbers of the public calling dispatch and inundating dispatch with phone calls while they're trying to dispatch us out to emergency runs. So it was overloading uh, dispatch tremendously. With, with the new system there, if we have a tornado warning, you will get a warning that says tornado warning, tells you when and where, tells you what you need to do or anything like that. It will have messages that tells you what you need to do for this specific type of warning. 
So as you know, one of the big arguments that we've heard against moving to Nixle systems is my 80 year old grandmother is not technologically savvy and so she depends upon uh, the warning sirens in, if, in case there's an emergency. I know you have sort of a response to those well, sort of arguments. Yeah, the warning sirens were never designed to be heard from indoor your house. They, they are the old air raid sirens from the 50s from the nuclear era and they were designed to tell people to get inside. If you can hear one if you can hear one inside your house, and most of the time very likely, unless you're extremely close to one of them, because they just, and, and in the event of a tornado with the winds and the noise that they're making, you would never hear that. I've tested multiple ones of these with my car out standing outside my vehicle three blocks away, and you can't hear the siren. So it, it's all just dependent on, I mean, if you got one right beside your house, you might be able to see, hear it, but more than likely not. And of course, you did some research, and most older folks actually do have cell phones these days. Yeah, uh, not everybody, but most. The the Pew Research Center, and it was in the mid 90, low to mid 90s, on the percentage of the adult population that actually have cell phones. So, if you fact, you know, when you got nursing homes, incarcerated people, if you factor some of that out, you've virtually got nearly 100 percent of the people that have cell phones, uh, and are using them. And this system goes to home phones too. And like uh, we talked about before, uh, older folks typically have compromised hearings. If they're in their home late at night asleep, chances are they're not necessarily going to hear a warning siren. I, you know, I have one probably eight, nine hundred feet from my house. I never heard it. My dogs managed to hear that thing in the middle of, of the night, but uh, I never did hear it. We've been talking with our fire chief, Brian Dunn. As I mentioned, we do this after, the, after each city council meeting. Of course, they meet on the first and third Tuesdays of the month. So we will see you for another council catch up in two weeks.